each of us know that there is a Savior. But we tend to forget there's also an enemy. And even though he has been condemned, even though he has been defeated, he is still spiritually dangerous. And his favorite tool, the Bible says, that he is the father of lies. And what you and I need to know about that is this, that he likes to distort the truth of God. He likes to take biblical doctrine and pervert it because he knows something. He knows the power of truth. We all know the verse, you shall believe in the truth and that truth shall set you free. Now that freedom, that liberty is so that we can serve God. But if we don't embrace the truth of God, if we latch on to something that is a distortion, something that is false, we're not going to have that freedom, that liberty. We are going to find ourselves spiritually oppressed. And the outcome of that is instead of bringing honor to God, instead of doing His will, instead of being instruments of His praise, His glory, that His purposes might be done, instead of that, we're going to be doing the opposite. And when we look at the state of the congregation of redeemed today, believers, no matter what country we're talking about, doesn't matter what language, any of those things, you can put aside. When we look at the condition of the believing community, we don't see the power, we don't see that the purposes of God are being carried out. And the main reason for that is false doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing to this young leader and he warns them. In verse 17, he speaks about two individuals from within the body of believers. And he names them. Oftentimes I get in trouble because I'll, I'll make mention of individuals. You know, we're accountable. And Paul did just that. And he says, these two have erred. They have turned away from fidelity. They have taught something. And what were they teaching? Now imagine this. Nearly 2,000 years ago. And they were teaching that their resurrection had already happened. Now we look at that and we say, well, I mean, no one would believe that. That's easy to discern as false teaching. But what we see is this. What we see is that it says in that same 18th verse that many had their faith overturned. Now, what does that mean? It is an idiom of confusion. Because of this false doctrine, they had their faith, that truth, became confused. And they saw others join with them. And the outcome of that? Lack of power, lack of anointing, lack of the purposes of God being done in that congregation. And that's why Paul, he admonished them, warned them concerning this. Paul was concerned about false doctrine. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, but also this Paul. Because when he casually asked me, why don't you come to Perth? I, I heard it as a, a godly invitation. And when we came to the conclusion that we were going to be able to come, Paul was quick to say, would you teach on this, this doctrine that is very popular today. In fact, it is growing rapidly within the evangelical world. It's called dominionism. Now, we are going to have dominion. That's a fact. But the question is, how does that come about? When I say dominion, I'm talking about kingdom. And there was those who were teaching just like nearly 2,000 years ago, when they said the resurrection had already 
happened. You know what they meant? Because biblically, when we look in the scripture, we see a connection between resurrection and the kingdom. And they were saying the kingdom is now. The kingdom is at hand. You say, well, there's scripture that says that. Be very careful. We need to understand what the intent was. What Satan frequently does is he perverts, he corrupts the pure, the proper intention of God. Once you learn two words, one we just mentioned, we'll talk more about that later on, but there's two false doctrines that are growing rapidly, not just in some obscure congregations, but in mainland, mainline denominations, within evangelical, in congregations that, that people would assume are biblically grounded. These two doctrines are growing, and it's all about a confusion concerning the power of God prophetically. I want to say that again. It's all an attempt to lessen, pervert, conceal the power of God prophetically. When we look at Scripture, whether we're talking about the Torah, the Torah is full of prophecy. When we look at books such as Psalms or books such as Esther, those writings, they're full of prophecy. And of course, prophecy, books like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're full of prophetic revelation. And understanding the prophetic truth of God is vital. Because if we don't know what's going to be, see, what did Messiah say to us? He spoke so frequently about the kingdom and how the kingdom would come. And here's the problem. Today, it is becoming more and more frequent. These passages where Paul, the apostles, or looking back at the Old Testament prophets, what they spoke about concerning the last days. Many people are saying, no, no, you've got it wrong. These things have already happened. You have misunderstood. You have an immature faith. You need to grow. You need to understand a, a better, a different way. The first word I want you to get is the word preterism. How many have heard that? Preterism. Okay, a few. You need to hear it. Preterism. It's important because, well, let me share with you a little bit about the origin of it. The word preterism derives from a Latin word. I think that's very interesting. Not a biblical word, but a Latin word. And the root of that word means that which is beyond or that which has passed. And here's the primary element here. And that is when we look at prophecy, for example, what we studied last year, our first time to Australia and Sydney, we looked at the book of Matthew in chapter 24. That Olivet Discourse. Why do we call it the Olivet Discourse? Simply because he was at the Mount of Olives. And let me share with you, this first session, we're going to be looking more at dogma and doctrine. We will get into looking at a variety of texts in a few minutes. But in our second session, we're going to focus in on one passage alone. And we're going to see a right view of what Messiah said about why he was coming and how that kingdom is going to be established. What we need to know to be found faithful. Didn't say to be saved. I said to be fine, faithful. That's our objective. So this term preterism, it comes from the Latin and it means past or beyond. And what they're saying is this. Passages like Matthew 24 that deals with Yeshua's teaching concerning the last days. They're saying all those things have already happened. Or the book of Revelation. All of that is in the past. Maybe the last two chapters, 21 and 22, it's futuristic, but everything else 
It's already happened. Now, if we don't understand what Messiah taught about the last days, because one of the things that he admonished us, his disciples, he uses a phrase, watch, look out. It's a word to perceive something for the purpose of response. I want to say that again. It is to perceive something for the purpose of response. If we don't understand it, we will not respond properly and we will not be pleasing to him. So if you're teaching that all these things are irrelevant today, they are things that have already happened. We have moved beyond that. We've moved past that. You see the problem? Those things that we're supposed to be looking for, we won't be. We won't have discernment. If we don't have discernment, we won't have obedience. If we don't have obedience, we won't have power. If we won't have power, we will be defeated. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about being found faithful, being a good and faithful servant, carrying out the purposes of God. So it's important that we know these things. Now, when we look, and let's talk a moment about Matthew 24, just a moment. You see, people look at that and say, oh, you don't understand that it's about 70 A.D. It's about the destruction of the second temple and the city of Jerusalem and that Roman exile. Well, that's true initially, initially. If you look sometime, and I would encourage you to write down just little phrases concerning what you need to go back to and read. And one of that is Matthew 24. It says in verse 1 that Yeshua was coming out of the temple and the disciples approached him. Unique word. They approached him. It's almost as though they confronted him. And they spoke about the buildings, the temple, the Sanhedrin on that temple mount in Jerusalem. And how beautiful they were. But we know at that time, there was spiritual corruption. Beautiful on the outside, corrupt on the inside. I think that's a message for us. They were emphasizing the outside, not that inner condition. What about you and me? And Yeshua, he said, I tell you the truth. Not one stone upon another will be left, that are not cast down. Now, what was he referring to? Everyone is in agreement with this. No debate. He was prophesying what would happen 40 years later when, when Titus would come in, the Roman leader, his armies, destroy the temple, destroy Jerusalem, and put the people into exile. The longest exile for the Jewish people. It still continues today because even though people are coming back to the land, there is not yet a temple. Now, let me ask you a question. Was he right? I mean, you can go to Jerusalem today and you can go to that area and see, literally, see some of those stones that were up on the Temple Mount that have been cast down. There is some left. What he said 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, well, let me ask you, was he right? Yes, he was. And then in verse 3, we see a change in location. Now, here's a problem. Most of us read the Bible too quick. When we read quickly, we tend to ignore biblical clues, scriptural indicators. And in verse 3, there's a change in location that's always significant. He's no longer in the temple. But now he's at a very prophetically significant location called the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives is related to his second coming, correct? Not speaking about what we studied last year in Sydney, the blessed hope, the rapture. But I'm speaking about his second coming when he will return as he 
went up and ascended from the Mount of Olives, he's going to return to the Mount of Olives, right? We'll talk more about that in our second session. So he's there on the Mount of Olives, and they want to know about these things that he said. But not just the destruction of the temple, but they also said two other things. What about your coming, meaning your return, and the time, and don't miss this, what about the end? Now, if you read Matthew 24, you are going to find that several times he speaks about the end. If you're wise, you're going to ask yourself, what end is he referring to? It's important. That's not our purpose today, but he was speaking about the end. Here's the message. It is wrong. It is incorrect. It is invalid biblically when you use the grammatical indicators to conclude that all of this already has taken place in 70 A.D. It's ridiculous. None of these things. But here's what they do. They'll say, oh, your problem is you take the Scripture too literally. That you only go by the plain, the simple understanding. You're spiritually immature. See, they will tell you that so much of prophecy, these things that Messiah taught, and not just Messiah, but Paul and the apostles, and Peter and others, John, they will tell you that you have to look at them as allegory. That you have to understand that they are highly, highly symbolic. That you have to spiritualize the text. In other words, don't, don't pay attention to what you're reading, but listen to wiser people. People who understand things better than you. Well, wait a second. Now, there's people that are smarter than us, but we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit promises for every believer, right, to teach us all truth. So we can understand the Word of God. We're not dependent. We can benefit from others, certainly. But you have a personal responsibility. The Scripture commands you. Study this to show yourself approved. And this is what's dangerous. When you rely upon other people and you allow their views to become your views. You need to see that if their views are really biblically correct, grounded. Because it's not their views. They're just repeating God's views. That's who we want. We want to know the things of God. So here, they tell you that it's all about 70 AD. And all these things, read the book of Revelation. We see that instantly. One-third of the trees are, are consumed. We see one-third of the water and the seas are not any longer. We see all these miraculous things. Have they happened yet? They have not. They'll say, oh, they're allegory. They're symbolic. No, they're not. Here's the problem. And this is what the real objective is satanically. And that is, they want to spiritualize, allegorize the text on these prophetic passages. And if you use that methodology, if you say, okay, then maybe, maybe we should do that with the resurrection. He really didn't rise bodily, but it was just a, a new rising up of his teachings. And that's exactly what some people have taught. That there was not a bodily resurrection. See, when you use false methodology and you apply that to other scriptures, you know what it does? It destroys the Word of God. That's the objective of Satan. He wants you to say, you know what? I, I, I can't understand this. I'm not going to invest in it. I'll just listen and become dependent upon others and do what they say and, and it'll be on their shoulders, not on mine. You know what that is? Laziness. It's being, it's being casual about your faith. And Satan loves it. He loves that. So we read in the scripture 
that, that God is going to do things exactly as the prophets have said. You know what he calls prophets? Read the book of Revelation. He refers to, and this just as in the book of Revelation, is also true elsewhere in the scripture. We see that so frequently prophets are called, prophets are called the servants of God. I like that. You know, the best thing that you can be called is a servant of God. It was good enough for Moses. I mean, we're all going to die if the Lord doesn't return previously. And he might. He might before we, we die. But if we die, what we should want on our, our tombstone is not blessed husband, wonderful father, but just one thing, servant of God. That's sufficient. That's sufficient. And it's only when we look to God's word that we can faithfully serve him. Now, we're talking about preterism, and we're going to look at some scripture in a moment, but I want us to also understand a few other things. And that is that there is a satanic attack today on theological education. And instead of using the methodology that has been part of the believing community, and also, by the way, if I come from a Jewish background, when you go into the synagogue every, every, every day, doesn't matter what day, holiday, Shabbat, at the beginning. Now, there's a time of corporate worship, but people come early. They come early because there's other things that we read in order to prepare us for the corporate worship. Isn't that a great thing? Just don't come in at the last minute with it. But you come in early to prepare yourself. And one of the things that we read every day are the 13 principles of not our faith. We read that at the end of the service in the morning. But at the beginning we read about principles of, of understanding, interpreting the Word of God. Isn't that great? There's laws. And it's only when we use these laws, these methodologies, that we can arrive at the truth. Now, they have them in Judaism, they also have them in Christianity. But here's what's happening today. Theological seminaries are leaving these methodologies, leaving these principles. They're saying, you know, grammar's not important. Let me give you an example. I went to seminary a little over 30 years ago, and it was required at where I studied that you take a year of Hebrew and a year of Greek minimally. Today, it is rare. So many theological institutions say, we, we've removed that from our, our curriculum. We moved it entirely. Some you can take it as an elective, most. It's not even there anymore. Not even there. And also what we're seeing is, instead of allowing and prayerfully approaching the text in order to see what the text wants to communicate to us. You know what's becoming? The main instrument for understanding from their perspective the Word of God. You know what it is? Culture. Culture. So what we do is we, and I don't recommend this, but this is what's happening. We are taking principles like justice. Now justice is biblical, that's good. But does not the scripture tell us lean not on your own understanding? This is the problem. They're bringing their view of justice, their view of righteousness, their view of what's important. And then looking at the text to try to confirm, support their foregone conclusions. Let me give you an example of this. Now, we know that, that prophetically, in the end times, that which is good is going to be called what? Evil. evil. And that which is evil is going to be seen as good. Now, there's a word today. It is hot on seminary campuses and in religious departments at secular universities. It's a word, pious. 
Now, pious is a Greek word, not pious as in reverence, but it sounds similar. And pious simply means it can be male or female, but in the Bible it's usually masculine. And it speaks about a, a young, adolescent boy. Maybe at the age of 13, 15, 17, 18, certainly not more than 20 years of age. And there's a man, James Neal. I don't know much about him, but, but he's written some materials on this word. Now, I'm telling you this because you need to know what's going on. If you don't know what the enemy's up to, it's hard to stand against him. And I'm not trying to pick out just one, one issue, but for our purpose, it just illustrates it so well. Because James Neal will tell you that this word, which means a young man, has sexual overtones. He never provides any evidence of that whatsoever. He just says it. Where does he get it from? His own mind. Never any proof, never any citation. And he says, and we all know the account of the centurion who had a servant who became very sick to the point of death, right? And he calls for Yeshua. Well, what James Neal says is that if we're mature, if we understand things properly, using culture as the key, really this depicted an immoral relation. She didn't call it immoral. I do. But he says it is to depict a relationship, remember, sexual connotation, between this centurion and this young man. And he says, and he interprets scripture. He says the reason why the centurion didn't want Yeshua to come, remember it says, I'm not worthy that you should come under my, my roof. He says the right understanding of it is this, that the centurion was concerned that if this young man saw the power firsthand with his eyes of Yeshua, that he might wanted to leave the centurion and, and be with Yeshua. Isn't that filthy? This is what's being taught today, to justify. And we see denomination after denomination, congregation after congregation, embracing what the Word of God calls an abomination. It's not popular. In fact, in more and more countries, if you take a biblical position, the government doesn't like it. But I just thought, you know, maybe we should look closer at this word. Because it's interesting that, that James Neal, you know, he references things in the Bible. But he didn't really do a study of that word pious. Is he right or is he wrong? Well, I want to share with you, if you take out your Bibles... Look with me, if you would, to Matthew 2.16, or just make a note and look at it later on. These scriptures are all going to be familiar with it. Here the word pious appears in the plural. So we're not talking about uh, young men, or we're not talking about a young man, we're talking about young men. And here that same word is used for a male two years or under. Now, you know where I'm going, right? Matthew 2. Remember King Herod, verse 16? He gives that, that command, does he not? To go and destroy, kill all these male infants, right? Does that have a sexual context? They're less than two years old. All it speaks about is a, a male. It can be an adolescent or it can even be, as in this case, someone younger. But see, he doesn't look to the Word of God. He doesn't use what he would call, which he does call, these archaic methodology. What's archaic methodology? To look in the Scripture where this Word appears elsewhere. Now that's just basic Bible study. If you want to know the meaning of that Word, look at all the places it appears. 
He doesn't do that. Why? Because if he were to do it, as we're going to look at some of them, the word appears 24 times, and it is never used in the way that he says, never. So he's a liar. He is an instrument of the enemy. He is presenting satanic propaganda, satanic propaganda. And he's popular. He's revered within the, the community that you know which one I'm referring to. And he's invited to speak at all these universities and colleges and such. Why? There's, that's his man. That's their man. Because he gives what they would say a biblical rationale for what they want. Let me give another scripture that this word appears. Write down Matthew 12, verse 18. Matthew 12, and I'm going to look at it for a moment and read it. Matthew 12 and verse 18. Now, in this context, we see again that what he says cannot be accepted. Matthew 12, verse 18. We read here. Behold my, what's the word? Servant. Now, this is referring to Messiah. And he's called a servant. See, the message is this. The word son, because sometimes this word can be translated frequently, not just as a boy or a young man, but with the concept of son. Biblically speaking, the word son relates to a servant. A son is supposed to glorify, serve his father. So here in this passage of scripture, we see here how we're talking about a servant. Likewise, we look at other places. Let me give you another one. Matthew 17, verse 18. Same thing. Now, this is where, this is where there's a father, right? He has a son who is possessed by an evil spirit. Remember, sometimes he casts him into fire, sometimes into water, right? It's a father's son. What does this have to do with what he's talking about? Absolutely nothing. Another scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 43 here, that same word is being used by or, or, or in regard to Yeshua when he was 12 years old. We all know the story, right? It's Passover time. Yeshua and his parents go up to Jerusalem to observe it. And then his parents leave, right? And the lad, the young man is left there, right? You remember the story? 12 years old. So now, according to James Neal, that word that always has to do with sexual context is being used a second time in regard to who? Yeshua. This is blasphemous. And more and more schools that, that receive money from believers are teaching this, presenting it. And by and large... The people that sit in the pew are what? Silent, complacent, supportive. And little by little, more and more agree with it. Well, for the sake of time, let me just also give you uh, Acts, chapters, Acts chapters 3 and 4 there again. This term is being used in regard to Yeshua and the relationship with His heavenly Father. And normally in the scripture, it's translated here as a servant. You see what I'm saying? What he's saying is biblically invalid. But it's being embraced and taught as biblical fact. And if you don't embrace it, good luck getting your degree. That's, that's the emphasis. You have to conform. They only want to put forth individuals that embrace these lies. Now, we're talking about how there's changes in theological education. I want to go to another important topic, and that is 
the study of the millennial, the millennial kingdom. Now, you're going to see that there's a connection, a correlation between what we're going to be doing in this for, first session is hopefully, my intent is that it will all come together. And we need to understand that unless you perceive, unless you grasp the millennial kingdom, if you ignore that, reject it, confused by it, do not understand the character, why it's there, you are not going to understand the transition between this age and the establishment of that kingdom. Failure to grasp the millennial kingdom will produce confusion, and that confusion will bring disobedience. Now, we're coming more to what, what Paul's concern was, this dominionism. And what people are saying is this, that currently, and there's two views, but there's just two expressions for the same unrighteous, ungodly view. There are some that are saying that right now we're in the kingdom, that Messiah is ruling on the throne of our heart. Now, that can, that can be true, but we're not in the kingdom of God right now. Because biblically, he is going to rule from the holy city of Jerusalem. And he is going to rule according to the commandments, the law, the Torah of God. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. And the problem is this, that all these prophecies that speak about the transition from this age to that age are done away with. So you need to understand this concept of millennialism. That thousand years. And the question is, when does Messiah return? Well, if we're living in the millennial now, and he's just ruling symbolically, spiritualizing the text, and he's ruling through my heart, then literally when he returns again, if we're in the millennial now, he comes when? After the millennial, post-millennialism. And that's growing today, growing within the church, within Christianity. Now, some don't like that term because for, for a long history, those who believed in that doctrine of post-millennialism, they were seen as unbiblical, as well they should be. So what are people doing today? They are getting rid of the millennial altogether. There's amillennialism, amillennialism, just I'm against it. I reject it. It doesn't exist. It's not there. And then you come to Revelation 20, that key chapter that speaks about the millennial kingdom. And what do they do? You got to understand it. It's spiritual. It's an allegory. You can't take it literally. Take it. Just ignore it. We should never ignore Scripture. We need to link Scripture with one another to understand the truths of God. But this is what's popular today. They take, and we need to remember, and many, many believers don't know this, that the kingdom comes in two stages. Did you know that? The kingdom comes in two stages. There's a millennial kingdom in this world from Jerusalem that Messiah is literally going to return to the Mount of Olives, comes down that Mount of Olives, we'll talk about an a image of that, a foreshadowing that in our second session. He's going to go through what gate? Eastern gate, the golden gate, the water gate on the east. And he is going to establish that kingdom for a thousand years. What they will tell you is, well, we're going to take that kingdom and what's called the second stage, the new Jerusalem. Now, when you read Revelation 20, 21 and 22, there are undeniable differences between the millennial kingdom and the new Jerusalem. What do they say? You're looking at the text too literal. You're taking the simple understanding. You need to grow. You need to mature. And therefore, they just link it together and say, yes, Messiah will come before. I'm pre-millennial. Now, we're not talking about anything to do now with the rapture. 
You've heard of pre-trib, post-trib, all of that. That's not our subject. Talked about that last year. We're talking about the millennial. And there's many who teach correctly that his return is premillennial, but what they do is they link both the millennial kingdom and the new Jerusalem, they combine them as one. You cannot do it. They have a different purpose. Now, another thing. See, Satan will never be consistent. We have to be, right? We're not at peace with one scripture disagreeing with another. We want to bring unity to the text, right? With the word of God, there is agreement. Satan could care less. He can use one group that says one thing and another group that says another. But what's very common in Judaism and growing, growing among much of what I would call liberal or progressive Christianity is a moving away from the supernatural. Moving away from the supernatural. Now, there are those who do just the opposite and embrace the supernatural. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. But Satan's willing to use both of those groups to accomplish what? His purposes. So there are those that, that really embrace that same thinking. How many of you ever heard of Rabbi Moshe Madidis, the Rambam? He, more than any individual, and he lived about a thousand years ago, his book called Mishnah Torah, which is several books, it's not the Mishnah, but it's simply called Mishnah. Now, the word Mishnah comes from the Hebrew word two. And there's two Mishnayot, we can say. There's the Mishnah, which are part of, you've heard of the Talmud. So the foundational text for the Talmud is the Mishnah. Now, the reason why it's called Mishnah, what does Mishnah mean? Two. Because we have the Torah from Mount Sinai, the written Torah, and in Judaism, they have the second Torah, the oral Torah. So it's the second one. We're not talking, when we say Mishnah Torah of Rambam, we're not talking about the Mishnah. The Mishnah was concluded, it began to be written down. You know the uh, term, the traditions of the elders? You should, because it's in the New Testament several times. That's the Mishnah, the traditions of the elders. It came into being at least written down about 50 years before the birth of Messiah. Under someone that you probably have heard of, Hillel, he was the first editor. But the final editor was a man by the name of what we call him, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the prince because he was the head of the Sanhedrin. And he was the final editor of the Mishnah. But approximately 800 years later, Rambam came along, and he used the same term, Mishnah, but for a different purpose, it's just two. He wrote a second kind of law. And it's called Rambam's Mishnah Torah. And what you need to know is this. When we look at Halakha, Jewish law, did you know that 95%, this is the percent that I get from, from well, large, respected rabbis today, 95% of Jewish law today comes directly from Rambam. Did you know that? Now, this is important because Rambam is the only one, only rabbi that has ever codified laws. Judaism, we like laws. He's the only one that has ever written laws that have been embraced by Judaism as a whole concerning the last days. So if we want to know the view of Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, in regard to the last days, we go to Rambam. We go to his Mishnah Torah. We go to the section called, called Malachim. Malachim, anyone know that? Kings. So what? Because Messiah is a king, right? He's the king of kings. And this is what Rambam says. He says, don't you think, or in other words, it's wrong for you to think that Messiah will do anything supernatural. Surprising to you? He says, don't think that Messiah will do anything supernatural. Don't think that the, 
Yomot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah, this is talking about the kingdom. That there will be anything different or unique during that kingdom. Now, his passage that he looks to, you all know this passage, Isaiah chapter 11, great passage, right? About how the Spirit of God is upon Messiah. He is that Netzer. And it says, you know, that the lion and the lamb will lay down together. The bear and the cow and the lion will eat what? Grass. They don't do that today. The cow does, but they don't. So there's going to be a change. A little child will put his hand into the, the hold of a viper, a dangerous snake, and nothing's going to happen. And a small child, he is going to be in control over the animal world, right? Does that happen today? No. He's going to. Rambam says, no, 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 no. The position of Judaism is this is all allegorical. This is all spiritualized by Rambam. And what he says is, the lion are the nations. The lamb is Israel. And how we understand it is simply that there's going to be an acceptance of Israel within the nations. That there's going to be peace. There's not going to be harm. And when he says, here's what Rambam says concerning how to recognize the Messiah. He says, Messiah, all of this is biblical, but it all deals with Messiah and his second coming, nothing to do with him as the suffering servant. And in Judaism, what we find is this, that they believe that you proclaim faith in Messiah after he's accomplished everything, not before. Interesting, isn't it? They will say there's no merit, there's nothing good coming from proclaiming anyone to be Messiah unless he does these few things. What is that? First, he brings the exiles, the Jewish exiles, back to Israel. Secondly, he must build a temple. Third, that he fights all wars and brings about peace throughout the world. And the fourth thing that he does is teach the Torah to every Jewish individual so that there's Torah observance among Israel or the Jewish people. But here again he says, don't think that the Messiah is going to do anything supernatural. All of this is going to be done as a mere man. That's the position of Judaism. It is removing anything supernatural. And, and much of the Christian world is growing. The theological world, seminaries, Bible colleges. They want to be what? They want to be popular. They want people to come. And here's what they're saying. There's a very well-known speaker, pastor in America. By the way, America, more than any other place, exports lies, deceit. And I'm talking about theologically. Realize that. America does a lot of wonderful things. But when it comes to theology, in the last hundred years, shameful, shameful. So many of the things that Rifka and I are experiencing when we travel are things that can be tied right back to certain congregations, certain movements that had their origin in America. Like what we're talking about, dominionism. It's not new, but it's, it's a new trend. It's a fad theology. And what these institutions are saying is that don't believe in all of these miracles, these signs and wonders. Now, we're going to get into others who say that should be emphasized. We'll come to that. But they're saying, don't get into all of this because everything's just going to go on naturally. And the miracle is that there's going to be justice, there's going to be peace, there's going to be harmony, and it's all going to come about because, because of enlightenment. And it's not from the truth of God, it's from this false theology. And all of this is going to get rise to 
something very different than we'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, let's look at some, some passages of Scripture that are very important. Look with me to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 2. Remember, we're talking about preterism, laying the foundation for it. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. What do we see here? He's speaking and he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven, what does your Bible say? Is what? Is near. Now, they like to use a multiplicity of different translations. And the reason why these groups do is because they're looking for the one that supports their per perspective. You know what they don't do? They don't look at the underlying Greek or Hebrew. Because that's not important to them. Remember the methodology. We have certain truths. They believe they're truths. They're lies. We hold these dear. And therefore, we look at biblical passages that support that. So they see them. They like repent, they don't really deal so much with repentance. They will say, don't bring a religious connotation to it. It's just turn. Turn and receive. Turn and accept the kingdom. Because where is it? They like the translation, for the kingdom is at hand. Or now. To justify their belief, we're living in the kingdom. Is that what that means? No. What he's talking about here, this passage, is that kingdom, that truth, that invitation to become a citizen of the kingdom is soon available. Based upon what Messiah is going to do, because right now, where is your citizenship? The kingdom of God. And you have the Holy Spirit by faith so that you can live out kingdom truth, that you can show and manifest that kingdom character. Yes, the kingdom's within us, so to speak, but it doesn't mean that what we're embracing now is the kingdom reality. Now, what they like to do, and I told you about this preacher in America, he says, stay away from the Old Testament. Just focus on the Gospels primarily. Amen. Why? He'll tell you why he says that. Because it's defensible. He says when you get into all these Old Testament things, and when you get into all this supernatural, it's very hard to defend it. And here's his view. He does not believe that with God, all things are possible. So they like to say that, that yes, it's symbolic. Yes, it's an allegory. Why? Because people who are modern, they're not going to believe in, in this book that talks about the Red Sea parting, all these things that were done. There's problems in this book, then we, we can't really defend them. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. If we deal with the text. So they want to only deal with a few things that they believe that other people, enlightened people, modern people, can, can accept. So they lessen. Part of this whole movement is to lessen the power of God. Because we really don't believe in a God who can do all things. No, we believe a God who is the champion of social justice. But here's the problem. It's their view of social justice. Let's look at another scripture. We're running out of time, so I'm going to skip over quite a bit, but look with me back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now, here's a scripture that is really foundational. They're kind of linchpin, so to speak, in their view. Matthew 24. Let's look at verse 34. Matthew 24, verse 34. He says here, Matthew 24, 34, Truly I say to you that this generation will not pass away until all these things 
are accomplished. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will not. So here's what they say. They say, right here we have proof. Yeshua is talking about these things. Remember, Matthew 24, the destruction of the temple, Jerusalem, and all these other things that he wrote. And their proof text is, he said, this generation will not pass away, so it has to be 70 A.D. Here's the problem. Look at the previous verse. Verse 33. For he says, Thus also, when you see all of these things, then you'll know that it is near that he's at the door. Here's the problem. They never deal with that text. They always like to remove texts from the context in which they come. Matthew 24, verse 33 is vital. Why is that? Because it's just not that generation in which Yeshua spoke to them. He says in verse 33, when you see what? All of these things. They haven't happened yet. You have to look at verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and up to verse 15. And a key event, the abomination of desolation. And then verses 16 through 28, where it talks about a time of persecution, the greatest time of persecution upon the Jewish people. Has all these things happened yet? No. He says, when you see these things that he mentions, these birth pains, all of what's written in Matthew 24, when you see these things, then that generation, he wasn't referring to those who saw simply the, abom simply the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's these other things that deal with what? What he said. The time of what? The end. The end time. That's what the emphasis here. 70 AD just confirms the prophetic ability of Messiah to foretell what's going to happen. He does so perfectly. So you have to look at not just a fraction of the text, and oftentimes they do that. We can give you examples of that later on. But let's look at another text that's very important. Look with me, if you would, to Joel chapter 2. Excuse me. The book of Acts chapter 2. It's also Joel chapter 2, but we're going to look at it from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Now, this is one that, that many people have problem with. You know the scripture, right? It says here that in the last days there's going to be signs, wonders. The sun is going to turn dark, right? Hopefully you're looking at it. Acts chapter 2, verses 16, 17, 18, and following. You can make a note of it, read it later on. This is taking place on the day of Pentecost, right? With the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And what we find here is that he says, if we look carefully at the text and what Peter's doing to explain, explain this, this phenomena, what's happening. Acts chapter 2, where he says, let's begin in verse, verse 16. Rather, this word that it's said, this is what's been said by means of the prophet Yoel. And it shall come about in the last days. Now, there's two understanding of this term, last days. Last days is always in regard to Messiah. And we think about the last days in regard to Messiah's second coming, but we can also think about it in regard to his first coming. There's a relationship between these. We're going to talk about this in our second session. He says, I will pour out, what's the first thing he says? My spirit. That's what happened on Pentecost. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Young men will have visions, see young uh, visions. Old men will dream dreams. 
also upon my servants and my maidservants in those days. I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. Now, that was going on nearly 2,000 years ago. But he wants to tie that with what he says later on. This hasn't been fulfilled. So what he's saying is this pouring out of the Spirit that's related to, and if you look at the context of Joel chapter 2, by the way, Joel chapter 3 in the Hebrew text, it all speaks about the significance of the Holy Spirit in the last days. The significance of the Holy Spirit coming on an individual because of redemption. And this is beginning God's work through something. And what is that? The ecclesia. What's that? Church. It speaks, the word ecclesia comes from a Greek word which means to be called out. And he's saying that is beginning nearly 2,000 years ago. But this prophecy is not going to have its completion until all of it. He's speaking in time. This is the beginning, but it's going to end with what we read about in verse, verse 19. The reality of that prophecy, just like in Matthew 24, began in the past. But it's going to be fulfilled in the future. When he does signs in the heavens above. And on the earth below, and you can read what he's going to do. This is yet to be fulfilled. His message has already began. The moving of the Holy Spirit is a reality. But not all of this prophecy has been fulfilled. We are the forerunners. We are the heralds of the establishment of the kingdom of God. So that's what he's talking about. So preterism wants to take all of these prophecies and say that, they've been un, that they have been fulfilled in order to justify the second view. And this is dominionism. Now, dominionism has a couple key passages. One is where it gets the word is from Genesis 1.28, where he tells Adam, man, he says, you shall have dominion. You're going to conquer and have dominion. But if you read the text, it's over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the fields. It's not a kingdom context. It's talking about a Garden of Eden context alone. And when the fall took place, that's no longer reality, correct? It will be. It will be. Now we're going to get to the heart of what we need to realize. See, we are going to have dominion, correct? Yes. It says in regard to the millennial kingdom, and I give you two scriptures, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, there's many others, but it says that we're going to rule and reign with Messiah. That's true. That's not what's debated. What's debated is how are we going to arrive there? How are we going to get there? And now we're coming to the heart of what, what Paul wanted us to speak about. And that is, are we going to bring it about or is Messiah? And the teaching today, what's growing is this. See, you are either in every decision that you make, everything that you do, you are either going to be moving to exalt self or to exalt God. No position in between. Either it's about you or it's about God. And what those who embrace dominionism, many like some of the teachings of preterism because they get rid of some problems that they have. And that is this. When we look at the establishment of the kingdom of God from a biblical standpoint, are things going to get better or are things going to get worse? Worse. Now that gives us an opportunity. Utilize the situation that you're in. Right? And as things get worse, let me say it another way. As things get darker, that gives your little light more of an opportunity. You can be seen differently. See, they say, no, no, no. 
What they teach is this, that the church is going to be successful. Now, that sounds good. I like success, right? And you can see that if people are being told, you're going to do it. You're going to usher in the kingdom. We are going to bring about justice and righteousness. We're going to do it. Their view is that the church is going to be so successful that Messiah is going to look down and he's waiting right now to see when it's a holy place and he can come. That's their view. That we're going to bring about holiness and righteousness and that, that our leadership, our views are going to be embraced by the government, by the arts, by every aspect in society. That we're going to convert all the world, every social aspect to faith. Now that sounds great, but we are not going to do that. See, this is where it comes to. When we look at what Messiah said about the last days, and we talked about this earlier in, in one of the cities we were in, we talked about the fact, get ready to suffer, right? Get ready to suffer. They hated Messiah. Who else are they going to hate? Us. They persecuted him. They're going to persecute us. Be ready. The more that we embrace the simple truth of this book, the more that we're going to be seen as outcasts, radicals, extremists, and extremely problematic, problematic in society. See, what they want to say is that we're going to change the world to our view. We're called to do that. We're called to labor for that. But we're not going to be successful. The world's going to reject us. Let me give you a scripture. We also talked about this. Revelation 13, 7. Here again, they reject it. But if you look at Revelation 13, 7, read that whole chapter speaks about an empire rising up that's going to wage war with the saints and overcome them. See, here's what Messiah taught us. He says, take up your and follow me. What's that word that I left out? Cross. Cross. They remove that. This is not their, their theology. They see this as defeat. See, that's how the world saw the cross, was it not? They thought he was defeated. It's okay to die for your faith. You should be praying for strength, praying for insight to realize we are going to be persecuted, many are going to be put to death. That's okay. Because our hope is in that resurrection. That, that resurrection and kingdom. So it's over, okay to be overcome by the world. Just don't submit to the world. Just don't agree with the world. We're called, are we not? We're called these sojourners, aliens, foreigners, because our citizenship is in, kingdom, in the kingdom. And we're not going to bring, we're not going to be the ones that bring about the kingdom. I don't know any prophecy Anywhere in the scripture, it says that. You know who brings it about? Messiah. Amen. He brings it about through something else that they don't like to talk about. And that is through his judgment and wrath. He's coming again. What does the scripture say? Read that famous John 3, 16. And don't stop. Read verse 17 as well. Because he says... I did not come to condemn the world. That's the first time. When he comes the second time, it's apart from salvation. He's not coming with the message of salvation. He's coming to condemn that which is opposed to his standards of righteousness. Now here's the problem. When we look at dominionism, these individuals, they speak about the kingdom of God, but it's a kingdom of God for the most part. What the most teach in this camp is righteousness, but apart from the law of God, apart from the commandment of God. Now, here's the danger. They are going to set up a kingdom that meets 
their standards. What they think is, is right, just, rather than what God has said. That's not what we see biblically. Messiah is coming back. We all know this verse. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He is going to reign with that rod of iron to enforce the commandments of his heavenly Father. That's the character of the kingdom. Why? Because the law and righteousness go together. The law doesn't make us righteous, but the law defines what righteousness is. They don't see it that way. It's these views of what they think is social justice, what they think is righteousness, apart from the truth of Scripture. Now, I'm running out of time, but look to one more Scripture. I want to say on, on schedule, look to, and this is the real, the passage that they love. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, and look at verses 19 and 20, probably in your Bible. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now, here, Peter is speaking, and he tells us, you know, he's sharing before the Jewish leadership, and he says something. He tells them that what they did they did in ignorance, rejecting Messiah. And he says in verse 19, Therefore, repent. And this word repentance means have remorse. Be grieved over our unrighteous decision. And repent in order that your sins might be blotted out. God's ready to forgive, correct? Yes. Next verse. Some have it at the end of verse 19. Others have it at the beginning of verse 20. Just keep reading. He says, on account that shall come the days of, and this is what's important, the days of, what does your Bible say? Refreshing. 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 Now, this is their foundational passage. Because this is what they're saying. They're saying there's a time coming, and now it is. When there's a time of refreshing, and they understand that as a new movement of the Holy Spirit. Now let me say, I agree with that. In the last days, the Holy Spirit is going to move in a mighty way to bring about the fruit, deliverance, Miracles. I believe in all these things. God wants to do much more than we're doing. Signs, wonders, miracles, removing of oppression, all of that. Is God interested in that? Yes, He is. So I'm not in disagreement with everything. So they say here, there is coming a time of refreshing. I believe there will be signs and wonders in a mighty way in the last days. Very similar to what we saw in the book of Acts. Get ready, it's going to happen. But here's the point of disagreement. Here's the problem with dominionism. They say it's this time of refreshing that is going to create a new apostleship, new apostles. Now, God's going to use, he may use you, you, each of us. All of us are going to be sent forth, right? Okay. We should see ourselves as brothers and sisters. That's what Messiah said, right? Didn't like this hierarchy. Okay. So there's going to be people sent forth, no question about that. There's going to be mighty deeds, signs and wonders, healings, deliverance. All of that is going to happen in order to manifest the truth and the power of God. But not to establish a new office of apostles. Now here's the problem. There are those that says this has already began. 
And there's already saying who these apostles are. And you can identify them through a unique and special anointing. Do you see that in the scripture? No. A new and special anointing whereby these will do, and their emphasis now is on signs and wonders for confirmation. I believe in signs and wonders. But it becomes the evidence in order to justify their call. To elevate them. Secondly, another, if you listen to what they're saying, it's also being accompanied this, this time of refreshing with, and always run when you hear this, special revelation. Special revelation that they have and you don't. And because they got it and you don't, they have authority and you submit. And it's to justify them, to exalt them. That they are going to be the ones, the leaders, to change the world and prepare it all for the coming of Messiah. That they're going to get everything just in place. So that Messiah doesn't bring the kingdom. He enters into the kingdom that we under the leadership of these new apostles do. And because they're going to be so successful, all of these prophecies that speak about persecution, the apostasy. Now, I realize I'm out of time, but just one or two more minutes. Paul speaks about that there's coming a falling away, an apostasy, right? That's going to happen. But see, if they're successful, there's not going to be an apostasy. The church is going to get wiser, more obedient, more righteous, more powerful, take more and more authority over this world. They don't see that. That's all in the past. See what's happening? They are building up people who are embracing this, to think that the good times are just around the corner. It's going to get better and better and better and better. But that's not what the scripture says. It's going to get worse. It's going to get darker. It's going to become more unrighteous. This falling away is necessary. Why? For the revealing of who? The man of sin, also known as the man of lawlessness. The world is going to fit him. That's what's happening. The world is going to, the church is going to fall away. The world's going to become worse. So it meets the character of this man of lawlessness. It's not going to get better. And what's going to happen is this, people who are embracing this, and by the way, as we travel, this is what we're encountering. Speaking with Paul earlier, this is what you're encountering around here. And it totally unprepares, is that a word? Unprepares the body of believers for prophetic truth and to be found faithful in that. They corrupt the word of God because you know what happens? It tickles people's ears. They hear exactly what they want. I'll close this session with this. True story. We were a month ago in the States, and there was a time of questions, and this woman raised her hand, and she says, you believe before any bad thing happens, don't you, that God will remove us? I said, well... If you mean bad thing, the wrath of God, yes. No, she says, no, I, I'm talking about persecution, tribulation, you know, any bad things happening to believers because we're believers. You, you believe, well, I said, no, I don't. I believe Acts 14, 22, which says, it's necessary to enter into the kingdom of God with much tribulation. Not the wrath of God, but 
persecution for our faith. And she said something. I appreciate her honesty because she gets, her, gets it right. She said, I'm going to have to re-examine my faith. Because her faith is based upon a false promise that she's not going to suffer for her faith. That she's not going to go through any trials or tribulation or persecution. And she says, if believing in him brings this upon me and my family because of our faith, I, I don't want. At least she's being honest. I admire that. She says, I've got to pray, but I, I've got to really soul search. I don't know if this is what I've bought into. And here's the, the concern. I think there's a lot of people that have bought into a false, a watered-down gospel message. And they're not going to be prepared for what God has, has called the congregation of redeemed to do, to walk with him, to be his servants in the last days. Are you ready? Father God, we, we praise you for the truth, not of man's words, but of your words. We pray that you would, if nothing more comes from this time, that would cause those who have come to study your word more carefully, to be aware of what's happening around them, perhaps in their congregation, that they would understand the call that they have, the preparation that they need, so that they will be found faithful, that they will hear those phrase, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's our purpose for a gathering here today. In Messiah's Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Baruch. Uh, wonderful teaching. Looking forward to session two. So, ladies and gents, there's refreshments outside. Some <laughs>